Bitter end. I'm going to start by apologizing for those of you who've come here expecting to hear Dr. Carter talking. I'm not Dr. Carter. You missed her opportunity because the schedule changed. Some people have been popping in and out. Sorry, you're stuck with me. Um, secondly, I've never given this talk before, so that usually means it's going to run long. Fortunately, I'm the last speaker of the day, so I've got all evening uh, to get this done. Uh, the. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the talk will largely, uh, uh, I'm going to sort of do the theoretical stuff in the beginning part, so that will certainly fit within the allotted time. And then I'm going to go a bunch of examples at the end, and I don't know how, I have no idea how long that's going to run. So let's just sort of start. Um, so the reality is that, you know, whereas the overall workflow in an anatomy lab or other labs for that matter, and, and my focus is AP, so, so I have anatomic pathology written in here, um, but, you know, the overall workflow is pretty similar from lab to lab. The details of the workflow in any particular lab have a number of unique subtleties that have been adapted to local environment, um, local personalities, uh, demands of clinicians, uh, whatever. And, and those, in, in ways you don't fully understand or appreciate necessarily, become really integral to the operation of the lab. Computer software is designed pretty much to control, constrain, direct, and drive workflow. Uh, and so the question becomes one of, of if, the, if there's a mismatch between what the software was designed to do and what our labs need the software to do, you introduce inefficiencies in the system. Ideally, we would like to not have to adapt our workflow to the idiosyncrasies of our computer systems. We would rather redesign the software to meet the idiosyncrasies of our workflow uh, and, and ideally gain some uh, efficiency uh, from that process. So because I'm going to run long, I thought I would start with my take-home messages and so then you can all leave and, and not have missed anything. So uh, my take-home messages, operational improvements can be obtained through uh, use of customized informatics tools. Those tools do not all have to be integrated into the laboratory information system, although some of them may require some level of integration. Uh, where possible, these tools should be designed philosophically to move the work forward rather than see, simply keeping track of what work has already been done. Uh, and that's something that's easy to do sometimes and not so easy to do other times. Uh, and, um, and finally, investments in customized solution can be incrementally expanded to address other problems. So, so this talk is going to be a, a bit of a mix of both uh, some theory and some, uh, some, some practical information. Hopefully, somebody, everyone will have something to take home from this. But first, you have the gap. And the gap is basically um, the difference between what would you, like your, your, what you would like your computers to do and what your LIS is able to do. Um, obviously, the LIS is at the core of the day-to-day -day operations in a clinical lab, and, but most of the LISs don't really meet fully all the needs of every lab. There are some, you know, it's one of those uh, um, Lincoln things, you know, there's, there's some, some systems will meet the, all the needs of some labs, and, 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 uh, um, but not all systems are going to meet the, all the needs of all the labs. And that's largely because these, these systems, uh, the vendors design them, they would like to sell them to more than one person, more than one client. And so they kind of represent the least common denominator, uh, the average environment uh, uh, that, that they think uh, exists within their client base, and that's what they target their development efforts efforts towards. Uh, specialty services may exist in your lab that were not uh, conceived of or thought to be economically viable for the uh, LIS vendors. And sometimes you have, as I mentioned, complex, unique environments, uh, unique people, uh, unique politics that need to be dealt with. So what are your options for filling the gaps? Well, you can make do with what you have and adapt your workflow to match the computer system. And in reality, that's kind of what most of us do. I call, would call that the coping option. Um, you can spend money. Uh, you can purchase a new LIS if you really think that the, your current one is way off base. Uh, you can contract with your LIS vendor to modify or enhance the LIS. And, you know, that's, pardon? Those are the pain options. Yes, those are the pain options. That's very good. Um, so, and, and number three on this list here, depending upon when you do it, will determine how much money you're going to have to spend. So if you do it at the time you're actually purchasing the LIS, you can, you can convince them to do some customizations as part of the whole purchase package. 
Uh, down the road, however, they're much less likely to want to do that for free. Happy to do it, uh, assuming that you're willing to pay for it. Uh, perhaps there's a third party software that may meet your need, and that's certainly something that could be investigated. And then finally, um, you can develop uh, custom software in house. So basically, you know, choices are cope, buy, or build. Coping, I'm not going to really speak to that much. That's between you and your analysts. Uh, um, and, and so, you know, you can sort of deal with that. But let's talk about the buy versus build decisions here. Certainly, um, due diligence demands that you investigate the possibility of purchasing a solution uh, before you embark on any custom software development. But seriously, ask yourself some important questions. How good is the fit to your workflow? How much are you going to have to adapt to what this software can do? Uh, is it cost prohibitive? The ones that seem to work the best always seem to be the ones that are the most expensive. Uh, and, and is that within your budget? Has it been successfully used in similar environments? That's an important question. Uh, sometimes people get creative in buying third-party software. They will buy a piece of software that was not intended really for the laboratory environment. Uh, perhaps it will adapt very well, perhaps not. Uh, so if there's examples, if the vendor can provide you with, uh, with similar uh, institutions, similar labs who are using their software, that can be very helpful. Don't forget about hidden costs associated with purchasing software. A lot of people simply look at the purchase price. And, and there's a lot more to uh, installing and implementing software than the purchase price. So there's the installation, um, there's the hardware costs that may be in, in, involved in it, any workflow adjustments. Are you going to have to hire somebody to maintain the software and keep it running? Um, does the software require that you use specific consumables that perhaps are more expensive than the consumables that you're currently using? Labels, slides, cassettes, those sorts of things. And then annual maintenance. Annual maintenance fees can be anywhere from 22 to 25 percent of the purchase price. Uh, so that's not an insignificant amount of money to consider over a, a, a multi-year period. But ultimately, one of the biggest um, obstacles to going down the build route is your institutional philosophy, both your, at your department level and at the institution level. Do they believe in custom software development or not? Um, and and if, if the answer is no, you've got a big uphill battle to fight. Um, and in many places, that, that answer becomes no because places get very risk adverse. And there's certain risks that are associated with, with developing your own software. In fact, um, many vendors actually um, go through a process, uh, especially at the implementation stage for, for large uh, software, of, of, of instilling this sense in their clients that the more you want to customize, the more likely your implementation is to fail. And so customizations are bad, and that kind of gets into IT people's heads, and that's difficult to get out. So that's, that's going to um, be something that you're certainly going to have to work on. What are the concerns that are expressed about in-house software development? Well, it requires too many people, is something that is often said. It's too expensive. We're not in the business of developing software. Um, anything we might want, someone has already written. Um, anything we develop won't be as good as what we can buy. And you know, what if the person who wrote it leaves after a few years? And then what are we going to do? So. I'm going to, as a public service, try to address some of these things. And we'll talk about some of the realities associated <laughs> with in-house uh, software development. Well, it doesn't really require too many people. It requires the right people. Uh, and, and that can be one person. It can be two people. Um, and we'll give some sort of examples. I'll spend a little bit more time on that. Too expensive. Well, in reality, you can get increased efficiency and productivity and can actually save money uh, by developing your own software. And I say I'm going to have some of the same wrapping problems that, that Jim had because we both developed ours on Macs and this is not. But what can we do? Um, we're not in the business. Well, you know, we're in the lab. We are in the business of technology development and adoption. So. A new technology comes out, we adopt it into our lab. Why should we view software any differently? Anything we might want, someone else has already written. Well, <laughs> really? Um, um, how good is the fit? How large is the compromise that you're going to have to make to get that into your environment? 
so those are the, 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 the counters to that. Uh, anything we develop won't be as good as what we can buy. Uh, you know, vendors are typically very constrained by the capabilities of the tool they chose to develop their product in. And many of these, these, these choices were made 10, 20 years ago um, and are therefore your, your, the current systems out there are built on 10, 20 year old technology. There's a lot of new technology out there uh, that, that you can take advantage of. So the biggie, what if the person who wrote it leaves after a first year, for, after a few years? Well, at least you got a few good years out of it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, if, don't underestimate that. Uh, when I first took, uh, uh, started running the informatics unit, I held off on custom software development for quite a long time, waiting for the vendor to come up with the, the, the extra piece of software, which was just the piece that I was going to need to make everything wonderful. Um, you can wait years and years and years. And uh, during those years of inefficiency uh, you, 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 uh, where you've had to cope, you could have very easily developed the right solution, gotten several good years of use out of it uh, before it, it, it uh, um, even if the person then ultimately left who, who, who developed it for you. But that's not it. So, so you got a few, worst case scenarios, you got a few years out of it. Um, it's going to probably run. It's not going to fail the day that the guy walks out the door. Um, and, uh, um, and if it does, it was probably too expensive to maintain anyway. And probably you should consider uh, reworking it. And the reality is, if it's truly valuable, then hire someone else to either maintain it or I more likely rewrite it using newer technology. And you get that functionality back. So, so I do think that there are um, uh, ways of dispelling some of these, of these myths. What are the advantages of in-house software development? Well, obviously, they can be custom designed to your needs and to your environment. Um, and that can yield substantial workflow improvements. And hopefully, I'll try to give some examples of that. Uh, Often you embark on one of these not really knowing for sure exactly what your needs are. And as you start to develop the solution, you, you, it's not that your, your needs necessarily change, but your understanding of your needs evolves. Um, they become better defined, and you can adapt your software to meet that better understanding. You can also incrementally add on new functionality, and that can be very important uh, in, in leveraging even greater benefit of your efforts. And you can enable new workflow, new roles, new functions that weren't previously possible without the existence of that software. So I'm going to talk a little bit about finding the right people um, because that that is that's tough, uh, and 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 there is no magic solution to figuring out how best to do that. It took us a fair amount of time to figure out how to uh, get the right team together, uh, and it took some failures uh, to figure out how to get the right team together. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, a single person can make a huge difference if you have simply one developer. Adding more developers becomes you know, an issue of project scope and, and development time. How much do you want them to develop and how fast do you want it out? If you're willing to wait for it, one developer can probably do a very good job of it, again, if it's the right person. More than one developer allows you to add specialized skill sets and that can markedly facilitate the development process. And if you have a division, uh, you know, a unit of, uh, of people uh, who are cross-covering for each other, that does give you uh, more risk if somebody decides sides to leave uh, because you have multiple people who understand the application and can, can continue to support it. A number of studies have looked at productivity of, of, of software developers with comparable levels of experience and background. And interestingly, have sh shown that their productivity can vary by a factor of 10, um, which is really quite remarkable. And so software development is kind of unique in that. Uh, for the most part, people's background determines to a large extent their productivity. That's just not the case with software development. So obviously, you'd like to get people on the right side of that factor of 10 equation, uh, if, if possible. And that's not always easy to do. Because there are a lot of people who market themselves as programmers who really are just super users uh, because a lot of the development environments that exist today don't really require you to have the mindset necessary to write good programs. Uh, you can get by with just piecing together, uh, um, play, pulling in, basically filling in values and forms uh, to, to build your custom software. Uh, make sure that if you're going to hire someone, you review examples of code that they've written. It is probably wise to do a quick internet search to make sure they haven't simply downloaded someone else's code and claimed it to be their own. Uh, 
because most people don't double check that. Um, but ultimately, their performance in your environment will be key. And it's going to take a while to figure that out. And their employment probation period may not be long enough for you to figure that out. So that's probably a discussion that you just have to have with them very frankly at the time that you hire them. Uh, and, and make it sort of very clear that, look, I know your probation period is perhaps 90 days, but you know we're going to do a reassessment at six months and, and at a year to see if you're really functioning in this environment in the way in which um, we are hoping that you will be able to function. So what are the factors that affect success? And this is just based on some um, uh, unsuccessful attempts on my part. Um, but you know, how much direction are they going to be given? So do you have people who can give these, uh, these programmers good direction? How much direction are they willing to take? Uh, some programmers uh, um, don't want to be directed. They feel they know what's best for you and are going to provide it and you're going to like it. Um, you know, what development tools have they used in the past? And is that compatible with your environment? How well do they understand the domain? Understanding the domain isn't crucial, but it really helps. So if they don't understand what pathologists do, um, they don't understand what the lab, uh, how the lab operates, it can be very difficult for them to develop usable applications in your environment. Um, how much do they expect the users to learn and adapt to their programming style versus the other way around? Um, I think that's an important thing to try and, 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 and get a sense for. Are they self-learners or do they need instruction, formalized instruction to learn? Um, People who aren't self-learners, you need to be careful about. That means that they actually, if they need to go to a class to learn how to develop a, or use a new technology, there's not going to be any class that you can send them to to get them to understand how the software is going to work in your environment. So they may not have the necessary skills to pick that up. So really look for self-learners. How strong are their problem-solving skills? Can they, can they take a, a complex problem and come up with a solution to it? Um, how well can they predict exceptions and accommodate them? How intense is their attention to detail? Uh, so a piece of software that works 95% of the time may sound good um, if you only have to use it once a day. But uh, uh, if you're using it, if it's really going to be helpful and you're going to use it a lot, a piece of software that fails multiple times a day is not going to be very helpful and not going to get a lot of buy-in. And also, to a certain extent, what is their level of pride in their product? I think that's sort of important. If they're just trying to produce something, get it out, and go home at the end of the day, um, that's a little something to be cautious about. Uh, you really want someone who's got a lot of pride, and, and they want people to use their, their product, and they want people to come up to them and say, this piece of software you wrote really has helped me be more efficient in what I do. Uh, and, uh, and so if you can find that, that's, that's the, the way to develop. So just to give you a little bit of our ex experience, our development team is not very big. Um, and so this is our development team. Um, we have a director of informatics, is a, who the pathologist. We will not give any names right now. Um, um, but uh, he can only spend about 0.2 FTEs on really clinical solution development um, because I've got to sign out. I've got to uh, fulfill a variety of other administrative responsibilities, both within in informatics and outside of informatics. I try to uh, focus mostly on workflow analysis, specification development, and the LIS integration component. We have our associate director of informatics, um, who's sitting in the back row back there. Um, he sends, I'm guessing, about 0.6 FTEs on actual clinical solution development time. Um, he's a non-pathologist physician with clinical informatics training. He does the business logic coding and the deployment decisions. Um, any of you looking for a programmer, you're not allowed to speak with him. Um, uh, we have another application uh, um, developer um, who spends about, uh, I'd say, 0.80% 80, uh, 80 of his time on clinical solution development. Uh, he has no medical training, but is a computer science uh, major uh, and does our user interface coding, some of the user training and initial troubles, troubleshooting and uh, spends the rest of his time on a variety of other IT activities. So if you add that up, about 1.6 FTEs, uh, we're transitioning another person who's predominantly worked on research systems over to some clinical system support. Um, so that's in process now. However, over the 14 years that, that we've been doing this, I've had five other full-time or part-time developers who've really failed to provide a lasting synergy with the team. So, so we've gone through a lot of other 
possibilities, people who we thought were going to be active contributors who we ultimately decided needed to go separate ways. Um, and they were either reassigned to other tasks if they're still within our unit or, or they have gone off to, uh, um, to develop in other domains. So just uh, um, uh, by way of sort of uh, um, so you can understand our environment, this is the structure of our informatics program at Yale. And uh, um, operationally, we have a, 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 an operations unit and a research and development unit. Uh, the operations unit's got infrastructure, clinical systems, and user services uh, that we have in, under there. Our research and development has got some basic informatics research faculty, as well as our custom solution developments, both for clinical and, and for for uh, research solutions. Uh, I don't want to imply that we've got tons of people. It looks like there are a lot of names up here. You'll notice the same names appear multiple times. We all wear multiple hats. Uh, so, uh, so although I might uh, sort of be running the unit and be one of the clinical systems developers, I also report to the systems manager when it comes to fixing problems with COPATH. Uh, um, and, and so we all have uh, act at multiple levels uh, within this environment. So here's some of the, the software that we've developed. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I've sort of excluded from this small reports or little things. These are what I would consider the bigger projects that we've tackled. And this is over multiple years um, and, and different teams. But, but the majority of this probably in the last five years. Uh, and, and I'm not going to go through all of these things um, in any detail, but just to run through the list. Digital image file management, scan document file management, dictation transcription management, uh, outreach support systems, outreach client interface systems, a repetitive task scheduling engine, which I'll talk more about later, histology asset tracking, frozen section diagnosis management and communication, a hot seat diagnosis tracking and evaluation system, uh, Altasoft dashboard system configuration, and uh, more recently, most recently, a synoptic diagnosis reporting tool. So, um, you know, I, I put this up there mostly to try to establish a little bit of credibility. We, we've we developed software in a variety of different domains. Uh, and, and Towards the end of this talk, I will show some examples of these and some of the benefits that we've derived from them. But let's talk now a little bit about the process uh, because I think we need to sort of focus on, on, on what is the process of uh, developing software. Assume you have the team, assume that you've got the philosophical buy-in, um, how you go about actually putting together a software solution. And, and there, is, there are a lot of formulas for this, a lot of various structures. This is, is, is a way I like to think about it. Um, this is not the only way of looking at this process, uh, but it's a, 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 a model that, that I've found effective. So, so you've got functional specifications first. What, these are based on use cases. What is it that the software has to do? How is it going to uh, uh, fit in your environment? Um, you need to understand the workflow for that. And we'll come back to each of these steps in some detail. Technical specifications address things like the data storage, software architecture, how scalable is your solution, what is the maintenance needs for it. Then there's the actual software development. You need the right tools, you need a test environment, you need to do some validation, you need to have some documentation for it. Deployment decisions, how do you transfer this into production, um, how you do the piloting, the training, the assessment, and then finally updates and enhancements, detecting bugs, correcting bugs, and then the infamous scope creep. Well, if you can do that, then maybe you can also do this extra little thing. Um, and, and very rapidly, the, the, the scope of the whole project gets larger and larger. So let's go through the, the steps. So. Um, my personal opinion that is that the functional and technical specifications development is the most important part of the design process. Now I should say that I'm biased because this is a step that I do. Uh, so you can, you can decide whether you think that's an accurate assessment. Um, um, but this is largely based on use cases. Uh, it would be nice if you could go to your users and say, okay, what do you want the software to look like? What do you want the screens to look like? What do you want the data fields to be? And have them just tell you. Um, not likely to happen. What they can do, however, is provide you with use cases. Uh, I need the software to be able to do this. Okay, is that the only thing you need to be, to be able to do? Well, no, under these circumstances it has to do this. Okay, should it always do it that way? Well, most of the time, but sometimes it should do it this way. So, so working through those use cases and aggregating that information somebody then has to assemble this into functional specifications. What should the screens look like? What do the data fields have to be? How is this going to fit in the workflow? 
So, so there's an integrating process in taking the multiple use cases and developing a solution that meets those use cases. Um, and ideally, the functional specs should specify what the screen's going to look like. When I develop functional specs, they've got diagrams of the screens. This is where I want, this is what the data fields should be, this is, is what the data fields show up, and this is what it means. And if you click on this button, this is what's going to happen. So the functionality should be addressed there. Uh, the technical specifications start to get into things like the data structure and the storage. Functional specs and technical specs can be separate documents, and, and for very large projects, they often are. Uh, but there's advantages to doing it as a single document because as you develop the technical specifications, you may need to make compromises in your functional specifications, and you need to understand what are the costs of those compromises. And so if there's one person who can do both of those things, that often will work out the best. But on the functional side, you know, what are the needs? What is the software supposed to do? How is it going to integrate into the workflow? Where is it going to be used? Who's going to be using it? Who's going to keep it running? And will it hold up to increasing use? and users. So scalability, very much a technical side of things because there are different ways of doing, uh, providing the same functionality, but you need to know how much it needs to be able to be scaled ultimately. So as I mentioned before, this could be a single document or it can be two different documents, but one document has definite advantages to it. It may require expertise in multiple areas, and so a team approach may be needed. Um, you know, future uses uh, provide use cases, and, 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 and so that's, uh, uh, you know, as you use it, you, you, you realize that, well, I'd like to, um, this, to also be able to do this in, in addition. And so once you, you solve one problem, new opportunities present themselves. You need workflow analysis. Uh, you have to be able to define what are the tasks, break down a process, uh, the uh, multi-step process into the various components. Uh, you may have someone with expertise in solution design or user interface development, uh, other expertises in database modeling and design, and then application structure and delivery. So those are the, the areas in which there needs to be some sort of skill set established. Then there's the questions of integration with your LIS. And there are different levels. And what I've done is taken some of the, uh, the software that we've developed here and divided into the four categories that I, uh, I've arbitrarily defined as standalone software, minimally integrated, deeply integrated, and fully integrated. And I should sort of say as a disclaimer out here, uh, we do have a unique uh, relationship with our LIS vendor uh, that, uh, that allows us to do customizations to our LIS. Uh, that's, uh, I think, pretty unique. Uh, not a lot of places have that. But uh, in many of these cases where you do need partially integrated or fully integrated solutions, you can contract with your LIS vendor uh, to either do those for you, or I'm sure if you pay them enough, they will let you do whatever you want to do to your system. Um, um, of course, they will take then no responsibility for anything you, you do, and so that's just uh, a price you pay. But standalone software solutions are our scan document man file management or outreach support system or repetitive task scheduling engine or hot seat diagnosis tracking evaluation system are, are standalone. They do not integrate with our application in any way. They do read data from the database, but that's your database. You can read data from it. You read data from it to write reports. There's no reason why you can't read data from it to operate other software. Uh, so, so there isn't sort of an issue there. Um, minimally integrated usually means that it has to write to the database. Um, it usually, it, it may be writing to only custom tables, or it may be um, writing into uh, existing uh, vendor supplied tables, in, in, in which case you need to understand the implications of that for any support uh, agreements that you may have with your vendor. And I have a few examples there, and we'll, we'll go through those. Um, deeply integrated ones actually start to affect the look and feel of the application. Uh, you need to, to restructure screens, you need to add fields to existing tables. Uh, those are what I consider deeply integrated. And then fully integrated is the software exists entirely within your LIS environment and, and, uh, and doesn't function outside the environment. Um, and I'm not really going to show that example because I don't really, we're, that's still in the process of being developed. So um, the process, so developing the software, you need, uh, you need to develop an environment. These things are often called IDEs for integrated development environments. Uh, you need to pick a programming language. Uh, we personally have chosen to standardize on Java for all of our, um, our standalone development. It's cross-platform uh, that works in that environment. It's open source. Uh, and, and I think 
relying on open source software is is an important way for uh, for reducing the risks of developing software. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this here, uh, but Peter Gershkovitz is going to give a talk on Thursday morning at one of the scientific sessions about using open source software uh, tools in software development. So what is open source software? For those of you who don't know that, um, this is, uh, uh, you have a select group of, of software developers. They self-designate themselves. Um, and they develop and improve a product and make it available for others to use and modify and incorporate it into their own solutions. Often this is available for free. Um, and often the source is provided for free. But not always. Sometimes it's only provided as, as compiled libraries. Um, and sometimes you have to pay some fees for it. Um, the most common uh, model is it's provided for free with the understanding that you can't then turn around and sell it to somebody else. Uh, so uh, so if, you, if you got it free and you enhance it, you have to provide what you develop uh, um, free. Is, is, is again, and there are a variety of different uh, um, uh, arrangements out there by which the software is available. The, uh, um, the development of software in your environment then is often becomes one of simply stitching together software that has already been written by a number of other people. And the advantage of, of, of using software that's been written by other people is it's been well tested, it's been well documented, it's been tested in a variety of different environments, and most of the bugs have been worked out of it. It also rapidly increases development, uh, t uh, rapidly decreases development time, and and allows you to to put your solutions together much faster. Examples, uh, um, and I misspelled Linux. Sorry about that. Um, but the Linux operating system, MySQL database, uh, Apache web server, Apache Tomcat, Google Web Toolkit, uh, Hibernate, Quartz, um, Happy API, which is an HL7 engine, iText, uh, JFreeChart. These are all uh, things you can just download for free and, and use them to develop software. And a huge chunk of the work has already been done for you. So don't feel like if you're going to go and embark on custom software developing, you have to start from scratch. You can download an HL7 engine um, and, 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 and start from there. Doesn't mean that you're going to be ready to go, but there, there's others, uh, um, but, uh, but a lot of the work is done. Using open soft software substantially mitigates the risk of custom software development uh, because it decreases the amount of development time and therefore the development costs, decreases the amount of code you have to write and therefore decreases your opportunity for introducing bugs or, or uh, what we call undocumented features into the code. Um, the, the modules are usually very well tested uh, and they're supported by communities. So you can go to communities. These, these, these communities often have very responsive listservs. Uh, so if the software doesn't behave in a, in, a, in a way in which you expected it to behave, you post a question and you can immediately get a lot of answers back, perhaps fixes that other people who've used this code have, have developed. We use a rapid application development model with the concept you release early, release often, um, rather than waiting until the, 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 the software is finely tuned and polished and, and all the documentation is written and you've got this nice 300 page manual which no one is ever going to read. Um, you, you basically get the modules out to the users as soon as you can, as soon as you have reached what might be considered a minimal functional unit, whatever that happens to be based on what you're developing, you try to get it out there. You, their users can see rapid benefits from the software development. You get buy-in from them into the whole development process. And you can get more rapid feedback that might allow you to redesign your specifications before you commit to a long-term development down a road that isn't going to perhaps get to where you thought it was going to go. Obviously, to do software development, you need a test environment. Probably don't want to do this in your production environment right out of the gate. So Dr. Carter told me I needed to talk about validation. And so uh, I'm going to talk about validation. I'm an anatomic pathologist. The one thing I know about validation is that it's something that clinical pathologists do. Um, <laughs> So um, so I'm, I'm sort of going into this with a bit of a disclaimer here. Um, I did a lot of reading uh, from the FDA websites, but please, nobody go out of here thinking, OK, here's the laws. I understand all the rules, um, because that's what Johnson Ard said. Um, I have no idea what I'm talking about here. Um, you've been warned. But there's a lot of interesting things you can look up on, uh, uh, on various websites. 
So, so the FDA, um, interestingly, um, determined back in 1988 that laboratory information systems, even though they are medical devices and therefore fall within the scope of the FDA, have been exempt from the 510K approval process uh, for, for a number of years, with the exception of blood banking software, which is not exempt. That still has to undergo FDA approval. Uh, so if you are going to start customizing your blood banking software, you might want to think twice about that. Uh, you may get yourself into some trouble. Just last year, they came up with a new definition of medical device data systems because there's just a lot more, uh, uh, a lot of the medical devices that are being made now are not simply physical devices, but data devices. And they're relying on data, they have software in them. And, and in their definition, they included software which stores and displays data from medical devices, not just the collection of the data, but any storage of the data or display of the data falls under their definition of medical device data systems. Interestingly, in a, in a somewhat uncharacteristic move, they reclassified medical device data systems from class three down to class one, which substantially decreases the, uh, the overhead associated with getting these things approved for use. Developers of medical device data systems are required to register with the FDA. So if you're going to be developing this stuff, in theory you're supposed to register. However, Title 21 of the Code of Federal, Federal Regulations, which uh, it governs the operations of the FDA as well as uh, um, this is Section 807 uh, here indicates that you, what is, people are exempt from registration, licensed practitioners, including physicians, dentists, and optometrists who manufacture or otherwise alter devices solely for use in their own practice. So if you're developing software for your own use in your own practices, you are not required to register with the FDA. If you want to turn around and sell that, then you have to register and, and, uh, and, and, and then the rules change a little bit. But if it's for internal use, there's no registration requirement. This year, their laboratory manual of quality policies, I didn't even know the FDA put out a laboratory manual of quality policies. So section 5.4.7.2 under computer use says when computers or automated equipment are used for the acquisition, processing, recording, reporting, storage, or retrieval of test data, if computer software is developed by the user, its development has to be documented in detail and algorithms have to be validated. Okay, well that's not terribly shocking. How do you do that? Well, you can actually go to a prior document they wrote 10 years earlier on general principles principles of software validation. And in the list of various things that the FDA has put out, this document is remarkably reasonable. Um, and so they define software validation as confirmation by examination and provision of objective evidence that the software specifications conform to the user needs and the intended uses, and that the particular requirements implemented through software can be consistently fulfilled. And, and this document acknowledges the fact that developers, you know, they have to determine how much testing is enough testing and that you can't test forever. At some point, you just have to use it. Um, rather, their goal is to achieve, uh, the, the goal of testing of custom software is to achieve a level of confidence that the software meets all requirements and expectations. And so I think that that's very reasonable and it gives you a lot of leeway. What does all this mean in practice? What do we do when we validate software? Well, I think it really depends an awful lot on what the software does. Um, is it going to create new data or is it simply displaying data that has already been captured or created um, but displaying it a different way? More importantly, will it be immediately obvious to the user if the software is not doing what it's supposed to do? So if you have software that's doing some sort of automated analysis and telling you whether or not the patient has cancer and it comes back with just a yes or a no, you might want to consider testing that pretty extensively uh, before you rely on it. On the other hand, if you simply have software that's going to um, retrieve uh, uh, report information and, and, and send it off uh, via email in an, in an encrypted fashion, you probably don't need to test that as extensively. So, so you have to sort of figure out what is it that the software is doing? Will the users um, know that the software is not functioning if it's not functioning? Because then the software will be, so they'll sort of self, uh, you know, um, they'll use the system or not use the system based on whether it works. And users 
just won't use software that doesn't work. And then there's no risk of using it. Um, and finally, you know, if you think that there's any chance that using the software could potentially result in an inappropriate clinical action, then you really need to have greater testing and good documentation of that. So bottom line is use common sense. Uh, if you're developing something that, that's a little more out there, that is trying to introduce some level of intelligence, uh, that has to be much more extensively tested than if you're simply moving data around or, or, or coming with ultimate displays. Finally, the solution deployment considerations. Um, you need to decide, are you going to roll this all out at once, or are you going to do it in stages? What time of day are you going to do this? Uh, you know, if you, uh, uh, you want to do it at a time when none of the users are using the system, that might be in the middle of the night. But then are you going to have your entire staff there ready to support it if it doesn't deploy in the way in which you want it to deploy? Uh, does there have to be a synchronization between database changes and application software changes uh, for it to work? What is your backup plan? You don't want to go into this without having thought about your backup plan. Sometimes there is no backup plan, and then you need to be really careful when you go into it. Uh, but you should have thought that process through. Um, if you can provide on-site support after deployment, so if you've deployed a module that's affecting the operation of the histology lab, having one of your developers in the histology lab the day it goes live can be very helpful in, in making sure that the users understand how it's supposed to be used, that they're using it correctly, and identifying bugs that may come up. And obviously, you need to do some training, and you need to increase the awareness of the users that something has changed and that they should monitor carefully for unexpected behavior. It's amazing how, how users will get used to a pop-up wheel uh, error. Um, they just dismiss it and go on with their business. If the computer doesn't stop them dead in their tracks, um, they will find a way of getting around the error and not telling anybody about it. Um, so I'll go on to service, I'll, I'll come across an error, and people will say, oh yeah, that's been coming up for it's ever since the upgrade. Okay, well the upgrade was four months ago, why has nobody told us? Um, well, you know, I was able to get it to work. Uh, and, and so you, you get some of that. So if you can heighten their awareness, let them know that any, any unusual behavior you'd like it, uh, like to let them know. One of my frequent one is, oh, I, I got an error message. Okay, great. What did the error message say? I don't know. I just hit okay, and, 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 and it went away. Uh, so uh, um, what I generally tell people is, when you get an error, step one, try to reproduce the error. So if you can make it happen again, then that's the most valuable piece of data that you can provide. Because if, if, if the developers can reproduce the error, then we can fix the error. If we can't reproduce the error, it makes it very difficult to fix. All right. So in the last 12 minutes, I'm going to run through a whirlwind of, of examples of various software development uh, that we have done with the goal of trying to each, each of these things to try to demonstrate a, a principle, hopefully, will come through. And there'll be uh, uh, different examples um, uh, trying to illustrate different points, and hopefully this will work, and maybe it'll be a complete failure, but then you can all just leave, and I'll be sitting here talking to myself. So, so histology asset uh, uh, tracking is what I would classify as a deeply integrated into our LAS solution. And we needed to face the buy versus build. Our vendor did have a, a tracking solution available that we could buy. And we evaluated that solution. And, and quite frankly, we found it lacking. It was designed on a model of a cassette labeler being present at each grossing station, which was never going to exist in our environment. We had too many grossing stations. Cassette labelers are very expensive. And we didn't have physical space to put it there, even if we had the money to buy them. Um, I didn't think it had enough constraints to assure patient safety, and that was really important to us. Um, the, uh, the software that, that the vendor provided assumed that if you created an asset, you used that asset. And so there was really no mechanism for saying, oh, I printed a cassette, but I never used it. Uh, and, uh, and, and sort of that was important. Um, you have this whole 90-10 rule. It's relatively easy to write software that deals with 90% of the uh, instances and 90% of the use cases, but that other 10% is really what's key to deciding whether the software is going to be useful in your environment or not. Because if it doesn't work for that other 10%, the exceptions, and people have to do a workaround to make it work, they will rapidly start doing the workaround even when they don't need to do the workaround. And then eventually you realize a few months later that nobody's actually using this software. Uh, that everyone's using the workarounds. Uh, and so that's uh, um, something to look at. 
the, uh, the, the vendor software used complex identifiers and barcodes, uh, which pretty much uh, prevented us from using those barcodes outside of the LIS. So we didn't want to go down that route. Uh, we wanted uh, barcodes that were, that were meaningful, uh, uh, where meaningful information was, was encoded in the barcode. The, uh, the, the vendor solution tracked the assets, but it really did not drive the workflow, and we wanted to drive the workflow forward. Um, and their solution was very expensive, and we were already hired, so from my chairman's perspective, we were free. Um, so these are some of the features that our asset tracking software um, that we developed can do. Um, it allows cassettes to be pre-made. Um, we can enter blocks. We enter blocks into our LIS by scanning them. Um, it promoted a single piece workflow and histology. Um, we did automatic ordering of slides for special situations like negative controls for immunostains. There was a slide reconciliation module which uh, identified whether cases were complete. We built some dashboards, and I'll show you that as an example of what I wanted to talk about, about moving work forward. Um, had special handling for unstained slides, quality assurance module for special stains in immunohistochemistry, and special handling of consults, other outside slides and blocks. And this is still evolving. This is a product that, that we've been developing. We constantly are, are tweaking it and modifying it, which is another advantage of having developed it, so that it can, uh, as new situations develop, we can address them. But let me talk about status monitoring. Um, for the most part, and I'm using blocks as an example here, for those of you who, who, who have explored this, you know that blocks have statuses and blocks progress through statuses. And they're ordered initially and then they get received in the histology and they get put on a, a, a processing batch. And then when they come out of the processor, they get embedded and then ultimately they get filed. I don't have cutting in here because I consider cutting to be more of a slide event than a block event, even though obviously you're cutting the, cutting the block. If one wanted to develop a dashboard to keep track of the status of all your blocks, you could develop a dashboard that basically told you how many blocks were ordered and how many blocks were received and how many blocks were on batch and how many blocks were embedded. And that would be relatively easy to do and some of the early dashboards that, that were out there did exactly that. But that is basically telling you where your status is, you know, where your blocks are. It doesn't tell you what you need to do to the blocks. It's not driving your workflow forward. And in fact, blocks that, that are embedded, some of those can be filed and some of those need to be cut. Um, and you'd like to know which are which so that the histology staff knows what to do. So we decided to use a somewhat more complicated model and to set up a dashboard that was based on what needs to be done next to a particular block. So, um, and there's to a certain degree of correspondence, so blocks that are ordered um, are ready to be picked up. That means the blocks have been entered in the computer system, they're sitting in the gross room, somebody has to go and pick them up. When they're received into the histology lab, they need to be put on a processing batch. Okay, great. Once they're on the processing batch, they could be in one of three places. Either they're ready to process, or you've started the processor, and they're in the processor, or they're out of the processor, and they need to be embedded. Um, and and this, which column a particular block falls into depends on the status of the processing batch that that block happens to be on. And all histology really needs to worry about um, if you're one of the embedders or how many blocks need to be embedded. They shouldn't spend a lot of time looking for a block that's still in the processor being processed uh, because there's nothing for them to embed. Likewise, once a block is embedded, it can either be needed, it either needs to be cut or it needs to be filed. And that depends on whether or not there's at least one slide that has been ordered on that block that has not yet been cut. And the histologist may not know that, but the computer knows that. And so if the computer knows that, it can split those up into the two categories. And the ones that are the, the, the histologists that are, that are assigned, or the histotechs that are assigned to cutting that particular day should be looking for the blocks that need to be cut and not for the, all the blocks that happen to have a status of embedded. So by combining information statuses from multiple different assets, you can actually philosophically design a dashboard that doesn't just keep track of what has happened, but really drives the workflow forward. 
So this is what our dashboard looks like. Um, and uh, we have our block categories um, uh, uh, as rows, the, 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 the various uh, um, what happens next as the various columns. The numbers indicate how many blocks there are at any given time in one of those categories. And the color indicates whether any blocks have lingered in that particular cell too long. Uh, so if there's a block that's been in the processor and the processor is done, um, they shouldn't be in the processor. And after a certain amount of time, that cell turns red to tell the histologist, hey, maybe you should go and get these blocks out of the processor because they're done. And then these things, this updates every couple of minutes. Um, so I don't know if you if you can see that, but uh, you can see that here's we have a, 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 a couple of minutes apart, and you can see how the numbers change as they do their work. So we have these on big uh, monitors in the histology lab, so that at any point from anywhere in the lab, you can see what's going on and what the status of that day's work is. If you click on any of these things, they're links. They bring up a list of all of the of the blocks that are currently in that cell and how long they have been waiting in that cell. Um, so in this particular case, we have some autopsy blocks that have been sitting here waiting uh, for 13 hours and 57 minutes and still haven't been embedded. So somebody who's supposed to be embedding autopsy blocks uh, um, hasn't been doing their job. Um, and then you can click on any individual asset and get the entire history of that asset. When was the cassette printed? When was it ordered? When was it received in histology? Um, when was it put on a batch? When did the processor get started? As well as who did this? And it just shows initials there, but if you, if you cursor over it, it gives you the person's full name. So this has made a huge impact on our, on our, on our workflow. It's made a huge impact on, on uh, tracking errors. Uh, so we used to have issues with uh, um, tracking errors uh, uh, in, our, with, in our blocks and our slides. And by tracking errors here, I'm talking about you know a block was received in histology, was never entered into our LIS. Or a block was entered into our LIS and was never received in histology. Or uh, the cassette came, but it was labeled incorrectly. Or the slides were mislabeled. And you can see that with the implementation of our asset tracking system, the, uh, um, those numbers improved tremendously. Uh, so this, this, is, this is sort of the kind of data that you like to sort of collect. Um, Turns out in this particular case, you know, when I was very, when I very proudly shared shared this with our chairman, um, he sort of looked at it and, and basically said, "Well, he really can't show this to the hospital people um, because he would have to explain why it was so bad before." <laughs> um, uh, so, so that's uh, that's something to keep in mind. Um, how does this play out? Well, the, uh, uh, can, can this actually save you money? Certainly. Our histotechs, after we implemented this system, were convinced that our workload had decreased substantially, um, when in fact that was not the case. And so the red line showed the number of blocks that they were cutting. It was constantly the same. Um, the amount of overtime dropped substantially after we instituted the tracking system, um, and the perception of their workload uh, changed substantially. So I'm told I have two minutes, and I'm going to go through like six other software solutions very quickly just to try and make one or two quick points about them. We developed a solution to our frozen section uh, management. Um, this is one that I would call minimally uh, integrated. And I'm probably going to talk a little bit beyond the time. And if people have to leave, I will not be at all offended if you get up and walk out. Um, so what was the need? There was increasing frequency of frozen sections. We needed ready access to prior information on patients at the time of frozen section. We were spending a lot of time trying to call into the ORs to communicate the diagnoses, and that took away from evaluating the next frozen section. There were some concerns from surgeons about acting on verbal diagnoses. Um, the legibility of the frozen section diagnoses was not what we would like it to be. Um, and they were sometimes not accurately recorded uh, in the LIS uh, because they had to be transcribed, and then we had some billing situations associated with it all. So the buy versus build decision here was a lot easier. Nobody sold it, uh, so uh, um, so we had to buy it. Um, the process um, is much as I illustrated, uh, much like I've illustrated before. Interestingly, first step was to manage the expectations of the chairs. Uh, my chair of pathology promised the chair of surgery we would have this up and running within a month, um, which was completely unrealistic. Uh, 
So, so that needed to be addressed. And then we went through the divine design process. I participated not only in the design, but also in the in the pilot phases and, and, and the testing of this. Um, it had to be easy to use. It had to be very practical. When you design these things, you need to think, how are you going to get your users to buy into this? If you're asking them to change what they do, there has to be some benefits for them to do this. You can dictate a change, but, uh, um, but that will only get you limited success. So we had to include value-added features. What was the advantage to the pathologists to use this? Um, and, and so we did that. Dynamic lists of active cases so they would know what frozens were actually running. Ready access to the surgeon's name and the OR phone number so they didn't have to look it up on a list. Immediate access to prior diagnoses on the patient. Real-time turnaround in information. Facilitated entries of the diagnoses um, and automatic uh, coding of, of, of the diagnoses in the LIS, as well as some new capabilities like image sharing and stuff. So this is what our frozen section module looks like. This is the pathology module. It lists here any active frozens. Uh, if they're in red, that means that, 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 that it hasn't, uh, that frozen is still in progress. Um, the various parts are listed there. There's uh, uh, the case selection area. There's the OR communication area, so you can decide which OR gets to see these results. The frozen site, the diagnosis entry area. Um, so if you're connected to an OR and this status will tell you what OR you're connected to, um, you type in a diagnosis, you hit transmit, they can see that visually in the OR on the big monitors that are present in all of the ORs at our institution. Um, we also added an image sharing area so you can you can share with the ORs a live video feed from the frozen section microscope or gross photos and a prior report uh, access area. So if you want to look up prior reports on the patient you can see that. Um, we also then did a data integration piece uh, um, so that the next time the case was brought up in our LIS, the frozen section diagnosis was automatically transferred into the LIS, didn't have to be transcribed, no questions about typographical errors, and all of the uh, staffing information was, was brought in and all of the, the fee codes uh, were automatically uh, entered into that. Um, that made a bit uh, a huge difference because it turns out when we did an analysis that we had a number of cases per week where the coding wasn't being done correctly. We were doing all the work, but we just weren't billing for the frozen sections uh, because someone forgot to enter the frozen section codes. That was a manual process. Um, and so you can look here at errors um, in our 8331s and 8332s, as well as errors in some of the other codes and how that, that, that changed when we deployed the uh, um, the, the copath integration model and then actually had to modify the working draft because we had some cases where we were actually billing twice for the same codes. Had to do a couple of refunds there. So what does this mean? Well, if you're talking about paying for the cost of the software, we were routinely in professional charges leaving $18,000 on the table. $18,000 per month of work that we had done that we just didn't bill for because someone forgot to enter the fee code. Um, technical charges were also up there substantially and that has decreased uh, markedly with the deployment uh, of this solution. So people say that custom software costs money. Actually, custom, sometimes custom software can make money. Digital image file management. This is a minimally integrated solution. I'm going to just go through this real quickly, but we basically had a lot of Macs in the department. Um, as was mentioned earlier um, in, in Dr. Hendricks' talk, if you uh, want to uh, deploy imaging solutions, uh, often that means that the camera has to be plugged into the computer that's running your, your software. Because we had Macintoshes, we were using a thin client solution, and so that wasn't an option. So we needed to come up with, with a unique solution. We also had a number of cameras that weren't formally approved by the vendor. Um, we wanted the images to be in patient reports, but we had other uses for them as well. So we devised a, a, a uh, imaging solution that uh, basically would take images from multiple sources. We had a little piece of custom software that would just help name it, naming them, but you could manually name them, dropped all the images into an image drop folder, and then we had a behind the scene test that would pick up the images, file them into our LIS. At the same time, we built a separate flat file image repository with internet access that allowed for more ready access to the images so you didn't have to go through the LIS. This is what our, our, our interface to it looks like. You call up a case, it shows you all of the, uh, the images images for the case. You can click on the images. Uh, you get a large version. And if you want a copy of the image, you just drag it from your web browser to your desktop. And you've now got a copy of that image. I mentioned that because when it came time to look at scan document file management, we said, well, we can expand on our existing solution 
to address scanned documents uh, as well. And we have a lot of requisitions that, that go through it, and the, the requisitions was, was the specific uh, type of document that we wanted to uh, address. Um, obviously, we want to have this available to the time of sign out, and there were a lot of sorting steps. We sorted the primary copy, we sorted the gross room copy, the billing copy had to be transferred to accounting, then we had to sort after everything was signed out, and then we moved them. And, you know, we had to, uh, uh, from the working drafts, and, and send them for microfilling and res microfilming and resort them and retaining these for, for two years. Um, turns out that, that with the, the case volume that we did, uh, we were estimating approximately 150,000 unique documents, requisition documents per year, most of which were copied at least once in our workflow. We were spending fifteen dollars to $25,000 per year just to get these things microfilmed. Uh, but the main cost was the manpower. You know, estimated that at least one full FTE was spent sorting and, and resorting and, and collating these documents. So we took our existing clinical image solution, which you see diagram there, and I just conformed, or contorted it a little bit, squished it down so it would take up less space. Uh, and now we take our requisition form, uh, we print out a little barcode label from our LIS, and that goes on the, on the document. We upgraded our copiers to copier scanners. No point in reinventing this technology. You can you can do this very easily, and these would then scan the documents and put all the documents into a requisition drop folder. We then built a little piece of custom software that would open all these documents digitally, find the barcode, read the barcode electronically. The barcode had the case number, rename the file based on the case number and then drop it into our image filing solution, which would then pick it up and take the images and put them into a requisition repository, which were also available through our, made available through our internet um, solution. We needed to have a little separate uh, section for cases where they couldn't read the barcodes. 90% um, of the time it couldn't read the barcodes, it was because somebody forgot to put the barcode on the, on the paperwork. <laughs> but you can see here's a sample paperwork, there's the barcode uh, on, the, on a little label. The software is able to find that, renumber it, number it, and so it automatically gets filed. There's not have to be a person taking each one of these things and filing the scanned image away. The image files uh, um, automatically got filed away with the case. Since we were doing this repetitive task, we thought, well, there are a bunch of other repetitive tasks we'd like to be able to do. And so, uh, you know, image filing, document filing, they were just two of them. And in fact, there were many other things which we would like to do on a regular basis, like check the nightly backup, did that work? Check the billing batches, distribute overdue case lists. Um, and there were also a variety of rare events which we would like to know when they occurred. So is the website still up? Are the web application still running? So we developed a, a, a repetitive task scheduling engine, which we fondly refer to as Artsy. Um, basically because we didn't have enough staff to keep up with all the stuff that we wanted to do. Um, and so we generalized our repetitive task management based on an open source solution, which is a court scheduling engine. Uh, and basically each task is written as a Java class, uh, and, uh, and you, so you define the Java class. You associate it with a trigger, when do you want it to run, and, uh, and, and then what do you want it to do. And, and so basically, you, you create all these job tasks. You can have as many as you want. You associate triggers and actions with them, load them into the scheduling engine, and these things can either send off pages or send off emails as necessary. So what are the kinds of tasks that we do? We currently have over 40 tasks running uh, um, uh, on this, um, and this, this, this engine never takes a day off, never goes on vacation, never complains. Um, every 20 seconds, we do our image and requisition and our dictation routing, uh, so that, that happens. Um, overdue caselets go out each weekday morning uh, to the attendings if the case is over six days old. It gets emailed to them. And each Monday morning, all the autopsy active case lists get mailed to each of our attendings. Uh, each attending you, you only gets a list of their particular cases. Um, we uh, have reports to move workflow, so gross-only gross, uh, um, you know, gross only cases that aren't ready to be signed out, that haven't been signed out. Various alerts get, get posted. We have some QA and monitoring 
monitoring reports. Every um, every morning, if you were on frozen section a couple days ago and you signed out some frozen section, you'd kind of like to know whether you got it right or not. So um, as that case gets signed out, so I was on frozen, you know, if I was on frozen section uh, last Thursday, as those cases start getting signed out this week, I will get an email that gives me, here's your frozen diagnosis, here was the final diagnosis. So, so all of our attendings get feedback uh, on, on, on those sorts of things. We also have a bunch of tasks that monitor our, our interfaces, tells us tells when the interfaces goes down, um, lets our users know when their passwords are about to expire, uh, all of these things that are sort of done automatically, as well as some rare event detection. So every five minutes we check to make sure our servers are running. Um, and if it's not, ITS gets paged. So, so we get notified immediately when the problem occurs. Uh, uh, billing batch fails, failures, those things get emailed, um, and then we have the ability to escalate those. So if nobody responds after a period of time, then pages start getting sent out. And we've gotten a lot of efficiencies, automated uh, uh, control of a lot of these things, regular monitoring of events, detecting rare events, um, and basically our support staff can now spend more time fixing problems rather than, than looking for the problems. I'm not going to go through this uh, um, last one. I'm just going to sort of, uh, we also developed a, a solution for handling hot seat um, management, um, including access to prior reports. I knew I wasn't going to get to all of this, but you never know. Um, I can talk to people about this if they're interested in afterwards. But uh, finally, I just wanted to bring back my take-home messages. Uh, hopefully, I've convinced you that operational improvements can be obtained through the use of customized tools. Those tools don't all have to be integrated into the LIS in order to be uh, useful. Uh, where possible, they should be designed to philosophically move the work forward rather than simply keeping track of what work was done. And investment in customized solutions can be incrementally expanded to address other problems. So thanks for your time. Sorry, I ran a little bit over. Um, I I will stay here as long as, and if anybody has questions, but I won't want to hold anybody hostage. Uh, and so if you'd like to uh, sneak on out, that would be great. Are there any other last minute announcements that you would like to do or no? It, it varies a, a lot based on uh, what the software does. Uh, there, uh, most of the software we, de we um, design, we design to solve a particular problem that our users have been complaining about a lack of functionality. And so often the, the, they are lined up to test the, the software. So, so uh, right now we're in the process of building a synoptic reporting tool. I have a list of people who want to be on the list of people to test first. Um, so, so I think that if you're solving a problem, if you're writing the software to solve a problem that has been identified, finding people willing to test that solution is not that difficult. If you're solving a problem nobody cares about, maybe you should be solving a different problem. Uh, <laughs> yes? No, actually, it, it, it's a little bit faster, and and I think there there's been an imp improvement in accuracy. Typing is not that doesn't take that much. I mean, most of these frozen section diagnoses are pretty much to the point, um, and so. Um, any time that you may have lost from having to type the diagnosis rather than write it, and a lot of people can type faster than they can write, and we have uh, chief residents there who, who, are, who are typing away as well. <clears throat> Any time you might have lost in that process, you more than make up for by the fact that you don't then have to get on the phone and call the diagnosis.